Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the Fairborn City Schools Board of Education regular meeting of Thursday, March 4th, 2021. Uh, normally, uh, we have one of the students lead us in the pledge, but I'm going to go back to uh, maybe an old student and a friend and a friend of the schools. Lori, will you uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Lori. It's a surprise pledge. <laughs> Mr. Philo, can we have the roll, please? Mr. McCourt. Here. Mr. Browning. Here. Mrs. Malad. Here. Ms. Ms. Reister. Here. Mr. Wilson. Here. Item number three is to approve the agenda as presented. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thanks, Jerry. Andy, thank you. May I have a roll call, please? Mr. Browning. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mrs. Malad. Yes. Ms. Reister. Yes. Mr. McCourt. Yes. Motion carries. Next item is to approve the minutes of the Thursday, February 4th, 2021 regular meeting with attachments. Again, may I have a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Mary. And a roll call, please. Ms. Reister. Yes. Mrs. Malad. Yep. Mr. Browning. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. McCourt. Yes. Next item is board reports and for the good of the order. Mr. Wilson, would you lead us off? Uh, I get to go first tonight. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to give a really big shout out to uh, Amy Gayhart uh, for her efforts in leading the uh, first COVID vaccine uh, clinic that we had here at the high school. Not just Amy, but the, all of the volunteers and staff members as well who uh, helped make that a, a very well organized uh, orderly event. So. Uh, had a little bit of uh, achy arm for a day after it, but other than that, uh, I didn't have any issues with it. Uh, it's interesting to drive down Maple Street and see the walls getting ever higher on the new intermediate school. It's good to see uh, progress going there, and we've got land clearing and signs going up for our new high school property. So lots of things uh, going up uh, with the new schools. Um, also, I've been participating in the, the committee that's wrapped around the uh, pending lawsuit for against the uh, expansion of the school voucher uh, program. And we have another meeting uh, tomorrow afternoon, another Zoom meeting on that. Uh, so there's some, some good progress uh, going on there. We've got some social media uh, sites uh, coming up, uh, which I'll feed to Pam Gayhart, so she can get those uh, links up on the school website, and uh, as well as the website that they that they're working on for that. Um, I haven't been in attending any of the athletic events. Uh, I figure I'll, I'll, with the COVID restrictions, I'll keep myself out of it and let the students, uh, parents, and relatives, and be able to attend those without. Uh, without any kind of uh, attendance restrictions or anything. So that's uh, that's about it for me. Thank you, Andy. Jerry? Yeah, you know, speaking of athletic events, uh, you know, the basketball season may not have gone how they were, but attended a number of those games, and it was just neat getting to see the kids be kids, you know, out on the court, those types of things. And then also see our pep band get to play at the games, uh, maybe returning back to normal a little bit. Uh, related to wrestling, I uh, wanted to give a shout out. We had two wrestlers qualify for districts, which are which are going on right now. Uh, Brody Hayes at 132, Jake Ingram at 220. We also had two alternates, uh, DJ Strosky at 113 and Hunter Boyd at 195. So I think it's outstanding that we've got wrestlers. Our our wrestling program is really starting to come back. Uh, there weren't we didn't even have enough wrestlers to field a team a few years ago, and uh, now we're able to do that, and uh, the program's coming back. So. And then I know you're going to talk about bowling, Pat, so I'll pass it oh, to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Katie? Okay. Um, 
so I serve as one of the treasurers for the Fairborn Music Club, which supports all of the um, music programs here at the high school and at the junior high. And we do have our Band-Aid campaign underway um, to make up for the loss of fundraising that um, kind of COVID decimated for us. I'd just like to say thank you to, um, we've had several community members who have already donated to that campaign and it's making a huge difference to what um, the kids are going to be able to do for uh, marching band and winter programs in the fall. Um, and if uh, that campaign is ongoing, so if it, you'd like to contribute, please let me know and I'll find a way to help you do that. <laughs> um, in regards to um, music programs, the winter drumline and um, winter guard are going on and the uh, drumline got to perform for the first time at Trent Arena this past weekend. The Winter Guard was their second um, competition and they've received superior ratings for both uh, performances that they've done so far, so we're very proud of them. And uh, the marching band kickoff, it's hard to believe we're starting to think about mm -hmm. fall already, but it looks like we might actually get to be on the field and perform coming up and that's gonna be March 22nd um, here at the high school. So I'm looking forward to seeing parents and families back out to um, get excited and uh, for doing that again. And then lastly, um, March is Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. I myself am a special education teacher and I'd like to give um, a shout out to my colleagues in the district who work so hard uh, to support this population and um, show these special people so much love. Uh, this population of people is a cause that's near and dear to my heart and I just want you to know that I see you and I see the efforts that you're putting forth every day. Thank you, Katie. All right. Um, <coughs> so basketball, um, we actually ended uh, the season uh, for at least the boys um, better than we have in several years past. So we're on the upswing there, building a solid program. Spring sports are well underway and it's again exciting to see kids getting out there and being able to be active and be normal and socialize and do all the things that high schoolers do um it was really cool to see all of the kids lined up on dayton yellow springs watching the alien drive the plane down <laughs> dayton yellow springs um so it was great to see the excitement in their faces to be able to see that it's not every day a plane drives down the road so so that was exciting and then um just to fishtail on the whole uh music club program uh, may 21st is the scheduled jazz fest uh, yes <laughs> so um, I have a uh, I have a vested interest as I have a freshman in in the jazz band. So if you uh, if you stay tuned, you'll start seeing some information about that as well. And I need donations for basket raffles. <laughs> <laughs> Please see me about that too. <laughs> so uh, I'm just excited. Uh, it's it's warming up and the kids are getting outside and they're able to do the things that kids do. So it's good stuff. And I'm happy that. I'm happy that we're finally moving towards some sort of normalcy again. So, Thank you, Mary. A um, couple things I have. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome back Jean Lawley, who uh, has been off uh, a little uh, under the weather here of late. But it's good to have you back. And uh, in talking with your wife, it's very good for her to be <laughs> back. <laughs> but um, also... Uh, just to talk about the bowling group, the boys did not advance. Um, the girls fell short, I think, by about 98 pins going to state. <coughs> but we do have one state qualifier, and that's Natalie Hansen. And I understand she'll be bowling tomorrow. Uh, we can't get up and see her because of the COVID, of course. But um, we have our snitches out there, and they'll be sending us uh, all the information as soon as it come, uh, becomes available. Baseball starting, of course, along with the spring sports. Uh, uh, all of those I've seen drumline in the uh, in the hallways and the gymnasium and everywhere else that they're around. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's exciting to see the weather turn, and, and uh, we'll be turning our clocks ahead here soon, uh, uh, I'm sure. And um, uh, but also just an exciting time for everybody, not only connected with the schools, but in the uh, in the city. Uh, we will start clearing the balance of the land for the new high school uh, that I think will should be done by the end of this month. And uh, so uh, 
we on the board, uh, some of uh, the, the members, uh, most of the members of the board are in constant meetings talking about that and how we do this and where we're putting that and all that good stuff. So uh, uh, you're going to see some things uh, in next year, in the next few short months. Uh, I think we're going to try and start turning a shovel sometime in July out there. So uh, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. It's going to be exciting, something I think uh, all of our uh, people in the community will be proud of. And, of course, we have the uh, taxpayers to thank uh, for that, and we most certainly do. So with that all said and done, Mr. Philo, would you please? Um, in terms of uh, recognition of visitors, public comments, uh, Mr. President, we have four people to speak. Uh, all four are talking about a uh, letter of concern. The first is we have Lori Venable. Um, if you want to come up and uh, talk in the mic, um, would ask that everybody address their comments to the board. Um, if you ask them a question, do not expect a response. It's more of you make your comments to the board, and it's not a sort of a give and take. So, okay. Yep. That should be on. Yes, okay. Fine. First, I want to thank the school board and all its employees for the extremely hard task you all have faced over the last year. I can't imagine having a child in school right now. To the school board, Mr. Lawley, and all of those that have stepped up to ensure that Fairborn City Schools are looking to the future and developing a strategic plan that includes new schools that our city and kids can be proud of. Thank you. I believe we all want the same things for Fairborn and our schools. We want our schools and the children of Fairborn to prosper and grow. We want Fairborn City Schools to continue on their road to excellence. So we're here tonight to ask you to join us in ensuring that our children have the best, best environment to learn and grow in. We're here to ask you, the Fairborn School Board, to sign a letter of concern, just like the Fairborn City Council did, and send it to the Ohio EPA, PUCO, the Ohio Developmental Agency, Ohio Representative Brian Lampton, Ohio Senator Bob Hackett, Governor DeWine, and the Greene County Commissioners. I know you have all heard of the Renergy Slaps Dovetail Biodigester in Bath Township on Hare Road less than 1.5 miles from the new high school, sorry, Pat, um, <laughs> that it's going to be built on Commerce Center. I believe most of you have heard of some of the negative side effects of this operation. It's just not the smell. It's the safety issue for children that live on Hare Road when buses have to drop their outside wheels off the side of the road when they attempt to navigate the same road as a semi-truck. It's the unknown health effects on our youngest population that don't have a vote in this process. It not only touches on issues such as health and safety, but farmer's land, contaminated commingling of crops, lack of long-term studies, welfare of our local resources, creeks, wetlands, nature preserve, outdoor experiences, unknown impacts on emergency management preparations, our new high school location, and the people that will be visiting our city for events at the new facility. It includes tax bases at the city, county, and maybe state level, and the list goes on. A member of our group has done an unofficial, non-scientific poll, and here are some of the disturbing facts. 55% 50, of respondents have experienced new or drastically increased respiratory issues. 52% of respondents have experienced new or drastically increased gastro, gastro I can't say that word. <laughs> Issues. 68 have 68 percent have experienced headaches, and 62 percent have said their household's health has gotten worse since being exposed to the biodigester that has come to town. This is affecting our children. So let's talk about dollars that are affected by this facility. This issue mainly affects the east side of Fairborn, where all the new housing developments are going in. This is the population that supported the levy for the new high school. So let's go back to the survey I spoke of before. 72% of the respondents said they have already begun the process to move, or at least talking seriously about the possibility. 78% of the respondents said they have known about, had they known about the biodigester prior to moving to Fairborn, they would have definitely avoided or it would have been a major factor to look elsewhere. If Dovetail wins in the court to be labeled a public utility, then they will not have to abide by township, city, county, 
or state zoning regulation. They have already purchased land on Byron Road. And in, in 2019, they submitted plans to open two new lagoons, totaling over 32 million gallons of sludge. They only have 5.5 million gallons on hand, and that's closer to the high school. If they are allowed to proceed with that expansion, we anticipate a mass exodus from the east side of Fairborn. Property values will plummet, affecting the tax revenue and enrollment in Fairborn City Schools will also see a downward spiral. We can't let that happen. Fairborn has worked too hard to allow one company to come in and destroy what has taken years to build. Let me leave you with one last bit of information. Dovetail paid less than $38,000 in property taxes last year. Only $24,000 to the school. How much do you stand to lose if East Fairborn has a mass exodus? I'd like to share with you um, one um, I'm sure you've seen on Facebook. You know, we're, we have a group. We're attempting to work this issue. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about what we can do. And one person mentioned that, why are we focusing on that? Why aren't we focusing on crime and things downtown? And one lady put it very succinctly. She said, you're not going to fix all those things if all the new construction areas in town smell like human feces. You run all the people out of town that can afford to leave and leave people who can't afford taxes to fix the town and statistically more likely to commit crime. This is a very serious issue for Fairborn. I'll be going to these meetings every time if I, if I did not have health issues. We are looking to buy another home and this is one of the things causing them to look elsewhere instead of just concentrating on looking at Fairborn. So we're already seeing people, you know, list their properties and think about moving elsewhere. So I just thought you guys should know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. <coughs> Um, next, we have Jake Fulton, and we'd ask people to limit their comments to five minutes. At the five-minute mark, I'll hold up the timer, so when I do that, just kind of wrap it up. Hi there. My name is Jake Fulton. I work for Fairborn City Schools. My wife and I have lived, uh, well, we've owned the property on Byron for almost 10 years now, but um, we've only lived there probably five, six years. We remodeled it for three years before we moved in. So my property out my back door it'd be 212 meters to the edge of the first lagoon if it were to be built and that's completely legal by the epa rules so a little bit on dovetail um so they sold this to the local farmer as we're going to take all your your animal waste and turn it into fertilizer which is not much different than what a lot of other farmers do but their, their thing was, well, we'll take the methane that naturally is emitted and we'll make a little energy off of it by burning it. And then you'll, you'll have fertilizer out the other end. That sounds awesome and perfect. And there's dairies up north that do it, but on a much smaller scale. This digester is, is, is huge compared to the amount of waste the farmer makes. So what they've done is they're bringing in industrial waste, they're bringing in human waste, and they're bringing in bio, um, like food waste things of that nature. It all gets mixed together. And what comes out the other end, they really can't tell you. Like they have a good idea what's coming out, but they don't know. And so if they were to run their generator every day of every hour for a year, based on the average kil kilowatt, there's somewhere in the $300,000 worth of energy a year is what they would make. They get per dump, they get $1,200 to $1,500 a dump of whether it be sewage or whatever the material is it's coming in they are there's been road studies done by the count county suggesting somewhere between 30 and 66 semis a day are going in and out of the facility so they're making far more money off the dump fee than they are what comes out the other end and so what this is what this is leading them to do is their business model and through the uh, appeals process when we were appealing the ponds that they tried to build in 2019, we learned through the way that they filed their uh, appeals that basically their business model is we take it, we run it through the digester and we dump it in a pond and we don't have a good plan of what to do with it once it's in the pond. 
So there is no exit strategy. There is no, they can't get rid of what they have now and then they want to add more to it times five or six. So it literally is gonna become a 30, and I'm, when you know she's talked about the size, that if you put them both together, you're looking at, um, I think it's 20 acres by 10 acres or 15 acres, 20 feet deep. I mean, this is a very large facility. And so I think we're coming here tonight and asking you to sign the letter. It, it's more of, they, they say it's just a few disgruntled people. And they've put this in their news presses. And every time the, the uh, WHIO asks for a response, it's like, well, it's just some, some disgruntled citizen. And that's not the case. I mean, it's all of Rona, it's all of Weatherford, the bluffs on Trayvine is getting it. And the city can only expand east and we're expanding right into a potential disaster. And so this is more giving people, it's another way that you can give the people that have been fighting this in the community a, a, a bigger voice by saying, yeah, th there's issues here and this needs to be addressed. And so I think that's what some of us are here doing tonight. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next we have Luke Borntracer. Good evening. I'm Luke Borntracer. Uh, I do not have a prepared statement or have I talked in front of the board before. However, I'm a longtime community uh, member. I've been working at the base 20 plus years. I plan on working at another 20. Uh, I've lived in and around Fairborn uh, quite a bit of time. I've got four kids. Proud graduate of 2016, my daughter. I've got one right now as a freshman. I've got one in fourth grade and I've got one in third grade. I am invested in Fairborn. I'm invested in the area. Uh, I lived on base for a few years, a couple different locations. Moved out to the far side towards lived in the city of Dayton. I stayed within the city of Fairborn because I like the school district. Got to the point to where I grew my, my lot. Um, needed to get the kids out. Definitely four kids that need to run. So I looked for a larger property. Found a great little spot, I thought, out on her road. I moved into that location. Not even four days later, there was this tremendous snow. I knew there was a hog farm right next to me. Now, I've grown up around hog farms. Out in Indiana, I grew up, I lived two miles from a hog farm. I knew the snow very well. My dad raised lambs and hogs growing up. My mother-in-law owns a, a, a campground up north, directly across from a hog farm. I'm aware of what hogs smell like. The smell is definitely not hog. It is definitely not agriculture. Had I known what I was getting into, I definitely would not have moved to the area. A lot of folks in the Rona Hills are expressing those same Result. They have moved into the area not knowing what was there. They got there and now it's going to affect them. Now, prior to moving in, uh, but now that I've moved in, I should say, the folks that are there and operating this have basically told me, said, hey, you know what you're getting into. You moved there, you know what you're getting into. We're about to build a great new high school coming down, right down the road. Did you go out and do a 24 hour air sample for a year back? Did you go out and do a, a water sample? Did you do soil samples? Likely, no. You probably did more of analysis of how this in relation to the folks, where the community is growing to, in relation to the highway, things that are feasible, things that you look at when you buy a property. The folks that operate out on her road somehow believe you don't have the right to clean air. You don't have the right to clean soil. You have no right to clean water. You should be checking on these things before you move anywhere. Now, to me, that's completely false. If you look at the digester, and you look at my property, you draw a line and extend that a mile and a half out, is it directly in line with the high school? Now, you will not smell this all the time, but I guarantee you, when the wind blows to the southwest, and high pressure system set in and pushes the air down to the ground, you will smell this. The high school will smell this. I have been out here at football practice a couple times, and I've smelled it further away than what I am right now, further away what we're going to do in the future. But that's the future. That's what's coming. That's what we're going to build. You know it's there, you know we're going to build a high school here. We're going to do our high school. What are you doing today about it? What's going on today? It's not really affecting us, correct? You're wrong. Every day I watch the <coughs> buses go up and down her road. Yesterday, 3.33 p.m., my two kids were on the bus coming home. My wife's walking out to the end of the lane to get them. A semi-truck is going down her, lane, her road. 
as it did so, it forced the bus off of the road. Right hand wheels were off the road, both the front and rear. Unsafe to operation. Now, this may have been a one time thing, right? These back roads are not designed for truck traffic that way, but hey, one time, right? Let's talk about the actual traffic on our roads. I've performed my own, I've taken this issue to Bath Township numerous times over the past two and a half years, and it is falling on deaf ears in Bath Township. It averages about 15 trucks a day coming in. Average. However, those modes of operation, days of operation, where I've counted as high as 79 trucks, almost 80 trucks a day, in and out, 160 passengers. Now imagine, if you will, watching this, you have two trucks right in front of my driveway passing. I've got one dropping its wheels a foot off the driveway on the far side, and the other one with its two foot into my driveway. My kids stand right there every morning. Now I keep them off the road, of course, and I talk to the trustees. And I asked them, you know, hey, are you worried about it? What's your solution? Their solution? Keep the kids off the road. It's not our responsibility. Don't take my word for it, though. As Jake mentioned, the Green County engineer came out and did a study, traffic study. Look at what was going on on her road. And the conclusion was, there's way too much traffic. That road was not designed for this. That road was not wide enough for this. Yet every day, we have at least four buses up and down that road, picking the kids up, dropping them off twice a day. And every day, they have trucks up and down that road. If you pull onto her road from 235, right down to the right-hand side, it slopes down. Just to the point that it was almost a five-foot drop. I have the bus drop its wheel off the right-hand side, and it will for her. There's a lot of stuff going out there, and we really appreciate you all. Don't just ask us. Talk to your driver. Ask them what they think. And we appreciate you all's support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> And last, we have Marilyn McCauley. Thank you all very much for this opportunity to share with you tonight my concern with the biodigester as well. Um, I've been in this town since, I think, 69. I've kind of forgotten. But I've been here so long, I now have great grandkids in the school system. So that gives you an idea how long I've been here. Um, I've watched this town and this school system go through a lot of ups and downs. And when I came back here in 03 from DC after been living up there for 13 years, the schools were pretty low. The city was pretty low. Um, and I watched them go lower. And fortunately, there was a magic moment about four, five, six years ago where everybody realized we have to play together. We got to work together and overcome some of these things that we have in front of us that is a real detriment to our community. I tell you what scares me about this situation that everybody's talking about. I am so afraid that the base will put Fairborne off limits to incoming military as well as civilians. And you say, oh, they wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, they would. They already have. What, a few years ago, Fairborne schools, consequently the city, was off limits to incomings due to the school system and some things in the city. So you say, how do you know? I talk to those incomings. I, I'm one of these people, I gotta go find out for myself if things are true or not true. I talk to those incomings, and they absolutely were told not to go to Fairborn. So you can see the price we paid as a result of that. Uh, I am so excited, though, by what has happened uh, in the last few years. I get cold chills. I get goosebumps coming down Dayton Hill Springs Road when I see that new primary school. And I see that water tower with Skyhawk on it. Uh, I watch the kids in the old primary school just waiting to get to their new school. And it's coming fast. And I go on down and I see the current high school. But we know that's a stepping stone as well. Then I go out on Commerce and I get really excited. In fact, my great granddaughter and I went by there last night and she said, will I ever get to go to a new school? 
And I said, well, you might make this one. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the dates all line up. You just might make this school. I, she said, I hope so. I'd like to spend one year in a new school. So having said all that, I am concerned that if the base puts Fairborn off limits again, that's not just a local problem. That becomes an international problem for Fairborn because that word gets around to the whole world. As those military go from base to base, that soon becomes the speak of the town for wherever they are in whatever part of the world they're in. So it's not a local issue if it goes that far. Um, it becomes international issue for all of us here locally, and I think we know the impacts that it can have. So let's not let it get that far, please. This is a big issue. It's a difficult issue. It's not going to be solved easily. It's not going to be solved overnight. But we all got to pull together on this thing. And this is one time bi I want big business to lose. I'm sorry. And I'm not anti-big business. But I am for my community. So it's important that we all pull together on this. Thank you. If I could just make a, a comment here, I, I appreciate all of your comments tonight. Um, just to let you know um, that we have been in some informal discussion with the board on this. We are going to have formal discussion tonight in executive session concerning this matter and is the route uh, that we want to take on, on this matter. We were, uh, yesterday I was in receipt of the letter from the city uh, we did look over that. I think all of you got a copy of that, if I'm not mistaken. So we are looking into this matter, and uh, we will address it in some capacity. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, uh, community, for your comments. Next item is school district presentations. Mr. McKnight or Mr. Lawley, would you like to yeah, do the no, intro? No, that's fine. Uh, Mr. McKnight here is going to update us on our uh, the graduation update with our seniors. Uh, you, you get recorded up there or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Lawley, and board in front of you guys, you, we, I gave this to you at the beginning of the school year. Uh, the first page is the Ohio High School graduation requirements. And this is for the classes of 21 and 22. So um, it, it basically, it, it, at the beginning it says cover the basics. But as we kind of dive into this real quick, you find out that it's not really basic. <laughs> so the first column is shows you are ready. So students, majority of our students, pass a Ohio State test and of course exam to earn 18 points. Um, or they earn an industry credential through the Career Center. The one change that has been updated uh, for this school year is English 1 is now taken off. So students only have to pass seven, or I'm sorry, six tests uh, for 18 points. So if students don't, are not able to get their 18 points, earn an industry credential, uh, workforce readiness, or earn a, reading, a remediation free ACT and SAT score, they can earn a diploma some other way. So if you flip the page, at the very bottom of that page it says or. So if they cannot earn it that, you can meet the new requirement by demonstrating competency and readiness for a job, college, military, or self-sustained profession. So earn a passing score on the Ohio High School's Algebra 1 and English 2 tests. Uh, students who do not pass these tests will be offered additional support and must retake the test at least once. And those retakes typically happen in the fall. Springtime is for new testees. So if testing is not your strength, you also can take the test, but you have three additional options to show your competency. So option one, and that demonstrates two career-focused activities. So proficiency score on web exams, 12-point credentialing, and a lot of that comes from your career center. So that doesn't, um, that affects probably approximately 200 of our students but the other 800 approximate have to pass an end of course exam or um, with some type of supporting work-based learning, earning required scores in the work keys, or earn the o OMJ readiness seal. They can do it option two, they can enlist in the military. 
So this is one way of, an, of boosting um, military enrollment uh, by signing a contract. Or three, our CCP program, students complete college coursework, which will earn credit, um, math and or college level English. And they have to earn two of the following seals. So the days, you know, I graduated in 1993, so the days of just passing your test are over. I mean, there are so many different requirements. Um, we have three local seals that were board approved last summer, but there are so many others that students can earn to show readiness uh, for college graduation. Now, I go into those to have you flip to the next page talking about student graduation data. We are currently going through our one needs assessment uh, that we have to do each year, which, um, which flows into our OIP. So we currently, I'm gonna kind of skim to some of this data. I'm looking at our freshmen, because our, our, I'm sorry, looking at our seniors, because that's, the senior class this year is being affected most by COVID. Um, 54 seniors right now are considered not on track to graduate. 33 of those are virtual, 21 of those are traditional. So, but it's not all gloom and doom because we know senioritis is setting in for quite a few of them. It happens every year. So this time last year, we had approximately, I think about 10 more students more than what is on here, but COVID does, cause, does present a challenge. So if you look at the rest of these numbers, you know, we also look at, we dig down to the data with students with disability. Um, you can see uh, how many students that are gifted that are, or that are struggling with graduation how many students that are English language learners, students in foster care, how many that are homeless, are economically disadvantaged students, and also it goes into how many students in grade 9 through 12 that are not on track to graduate from each identified student population. So what are we going to do with these children? Because we love them, but we don't want them forever. <laughs> and asking them, they only wait, they want to finish in four years too. They don't want to finish in five. So that, that's that's 100% rate on that. So the high school plan this year is we, we for our senior students are not are they in danger of graduating. We do have a credit recovery program that we identify students that are in danger because of not earning enough credit. So we take those students, we put them in a credit recovery program immediately to obtain credits that they are lacking. We also offer, we're gonna offer credit recovery on Saturday mornings because some students, even though they have a laptop, they may not have the best service at home. Uh, wireless connection, um, hotspots, or internet. So we're gonna offer them to come in um, and get help as needed. And what we also, this year, this year we created an at-risk community, so we call it ARC. Um, it, it's myself, my two APs, my counselors, a special ed teacher and a gen ed teacher. And we go through the seniors first of who are in danger of not graduating. We have, we've identified the 54. We've put them kind of in a, in a color chart, red being, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? <laughs> and and of, that, of that chart, we have about eight um, of those 54 that for whatever reason may not graduate. And, and I think a lot of that comes down to not wanting to drop out, not wanting to finish, it's too hard, I don't like school anymore. So with that at-risk committee, we've created kind of a mentorship program. For example, I mentor three seniors that, that are in danger or need some motivation. So I meet with, meet with them once a week during lunchtime, I go out, I buy them lunch, we come in and we sit down and talk about strategies to be successful. And I think a lot of them, <coughs> excuse me, I know a lot of them are they're, they're needing us, they're needing school. So much has been taken away from them. The mental health, the social well-being, they struggle. And once they realize that people do care, then they kind of step it up, they get rejuvenated. So the three kids that I meet with and provide lunch, Taco Bell seems to be the favorite for most of them. Um, we, we, are, we are showing growth and gain, and that's what we want to continue doing. Um, but I wanted to bring to you tonight, just to kind of give you an update of where we are. Um, we knew that COVID was going to be an issue for graduating and for attendance. Um, we, are, we are dealt what we're dealt with, but we do not give up on these kids at all. 
Uh, I tell the parents and I tell the kids, when you walk in the building, I'm going to treat you like I would my own kid. You're going to get the best teaching. You're going to get the best experience possible. But our main goal is to get you graduated. We're successful. It is your turn. So that's, what, that's the constant message that me and my staff send to our students. Um, so with this information, I'm going to pass. Does anybody have any questions? Just thank you for the extra efforts for these kids. Because okay. it's, it's, I, I, it's got to be a tremendous challenge to get through to, to some of these. So it's, thank you very much yeah, to you, you and your staff for those efforts. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I had the same concern on what COVID had on the impact of the kids and the numbers and at risk and stuff. So it's good there's a process in place to take care, you know, try to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Mr. McKnight. Uh, now for facilities update, I'm going to pinch hit for um, Mr. Patrick. Uh, but before I get into the facilities, just to follow up a little bit on the vaccine, uh, as was mentioned, we had our first round. Our second round is scheduled March the 12th. And I think, are we still looking for volunteers to help out? Are we in good shape? Good shape? Okay, cool. There you go. That's how organized Mrs. <laughs> Gayhart is. So uh, uh, she has put together a nice program there. So again, that's second round, and the majority of our staff will be uh, have their vaccine, and uh, we're, we're getting through this. Slowly but surely, we're, we're getting through this. Okay, uh, just to update you on the primary school, uh, uh, there have been leaks. Uh, four or five times, uh, some faulty uh, equipment put in. Uh, Monarch Construction has been sent a letter by the Ohio Facility Construction Committee or, and uh, that the fitting that they've been using um, is leaking, need to be replaced, and that is on the hot water pipes. And those, uh, those hot water pipes are about a little less than two feet in diameter. So we are working with legal counsel and um, to get that problem resolved. They are starting to work on that. That'll go into the summer, replacing a number of those parts throughout the building. So we're trying to get that problem corrected slowly but surely. The new intermediate going up on Maple. I'm happy to say that we're 17 months out from going into that building. Uh, and, and, and Marilyn, uh, just to echo what you said, this is truly exciting times. And it's important, I agree, that we all work together and we're gonna to continue to work together, the schools, the city, and this community and hats off to our taxpayers of this community that, that have made this possible. So we are making progress. February was a little bit of a slow month, as you know. It was the coldest month of the winter, but I think we're through that. They're a little bit behind, but nothing to be alarmed about. So hoping March, this is March the 4th, so I hope we will get uh, some pretty good weather. I did see a wall going up yesterday that was yeah. braced. Mm -hmm. So there is a wall, uh, block wall that is being constructed as we speak. So again, exciting times. Again, we're 17 months out of moving into that. Uh, the current high school board members, uh, you do have an emergency resolution on tonight's board agenda to replace the air HVAC system here at the high school. Uh, due to time restraints, um, we're progressing pretty quickly in order uh, in ordering the materials and hope that that does not get delayed. Uh, hopefully, Jake, uh, is a part of that. Our maintenance guys could start some of the work during spring break and uh, Weibel will be starting that work in April. So we have hired Weibel to do that work. The future high school, again, exciting times. Um, we have started the first round of um, department meetings uh, the last couple of weeks, and those will run through next week. So what those department meetings do, we meet with the high school teachers. They have input on that classroom and how they want some things designed. So we do get their input uh, that we feel is very, very important to the construction of this high school. Uh, Kleinger's, uh, they have staked the property back out. So if you drove along Maple, you can see fresh stakes as to where the property begins and ends and all that as it goes into the wetlands uh, uh, on the north end. Uh, a curb, ha I just saw a picture right before the board meeting. A curb has been cut out 
for a temporary drive to get equipment into the site. And we're going to start clearing that land uh, any day now. We're going to clear the entire site. Trees are coming down. And about 75 acres you're going to see completely cleared. There's also an emergency resolution on tonight, board members, uh, that we're going to hire Vermilion Tree Service to clear <coughs> the land by the end of March 31st. So we're moving. We hope to break ground and start shoveling dirt uh, in July sometime. So uh, we've got a number of permits we have to get, work through some of that stuff. But uh, our goal is to start turning dirt for a new high school in July. Um, with that, that's an update on our facilities. Any questions? How many months away are we at a new high school, Gene? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. We are, I forgot I did have that written here. We're 29 months out with a new high school. Wow. Thank you for that. I had that written there and forgot to read that. So, thank Marilyn, what, uh, what class is your uh, granddaughter? Oh, she's definitely. Oh, yeah. She'll, oh, yeah. she'll, be, <laughs> she'll have four. She'll have four years in the new high school. <laughs> Great news. Thank you, Mr. Lolly. Item number eight from the Department of Budget and Finance. A couple recommendations there. Uh, hang on a second, Pat. Sure. Uh, the for the for the audience here, uh, this is we're going into our business section. So if you you know, you take a... If you want to stay, it, but it's not going to be yeah, any cooler from here you're on out. You're welcome to stay, <laughs> but here's, here's a chance for you. <laughs> this is the escape pod. Okay. <laughs> Lori, I can't believe you're leaving. <laughs> We're just getting to the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm leaving my blue Vikings. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good evening tonight. Thanks for coming. Good seeing you, Marilyn. You too. Back to back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm talking to you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, Good Kathy. Night. Thanks Bye. for coming. Oh, Grace, you're stuck with us. <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, two items under budget and finance with attachments. May I have a motion? So moved. Thanks, Jerry. Second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mr. Browning. Yes. Mrs. Malad. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Ms. Reister. Yes. Mr. McCourt. Yes. Motion carries. Item number nine, administrative reports and superintendent recommendations. You can see there, and we will continue on to page four. And a part of that, as uh, Mr. Lolly have mentioned, resolution on the HVAC here at the high school and the uh, emergency uh, or urgent necessity waiving the competitive bidding on the um, tree service out at the new site. And again, you have attachments on both of those. May I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Andy. Second. Thanks, Mary. And a roll call, Mr. Philo. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Ms. Reister. Yes. Mr. Browning. Yes. Mrs. Malad. Yes. Mr. McCourt. Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Wilson has been uh, asked to give and graciously has accepted <laughs> the gifts and donations. Andrew? As, as always, we, we gratefully uh, uh, appreciate the gifts that we receive from members of the community. Uh, we have Cora Craft, a handmade face mask for students um, or several face masks for students. Bron Julian, one tablet for student use. Amanda Sarzi, knitted hats and headbands for students in need, and particularly with the cold weather, that's very beneficial. And a number of turf field donations. James and Karen Adkins, $25. Tara and Linda Baugh, $250. Thomas and Judith Baugh, $500. Paul Buford Jr., $100. Bob and Deborah Carrico, $150. Peggy Cruz, $100. Uh, Joyce Dennis, 500. Robert and Dorothy Apirio, 50. Bill and Jane Dorley, 100. Joseph Drock Jr., 100. Flavor Producers, 60. Christopher Heck, 500. Robert and Ann Inglesby, 20. 
Teresa Kinter Buford, 100, David McCormick, 250, Mark and Denise Minch, 75, Craig Moore, 50, Arnold Bonnie Penix, 500, Sean Quinn, 60, Lewis and Doris Reed, 1,000. Very generous offer their donation there. Steve Ross, 25, Gregory Shively Trust, 100, Lester and Beverly Smith, 250, and $100 from myself. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Board of Education will now go into a uh, work session. Um,